Nostalgia is quite powerful. We all have it in some form whether we like to admit it or not. The definition simply states that nostalgia is a sentimental longing or affection for the past, typically for a time period or even a place with happy personal associations. It could be the treehouse in the backyard that you and your friends used to hang out or just your old GameCube collection. Some people have an affection for a specific time period and naturally things from that time period. A lot of my coworkers often discuss TV shows and movies that they watched a lot as a kid, or even video games they spent hours upon hours on. I myself have quite the affection for VHS tapes because even if they're inferior to DVDs due to having their original picture modified for a 4x3 aspect ratio that was common with the television sets of the time, it doesn't take away how much I loved watching all those movies as a kid, even with the pan and scan. But when discussing something from the past, nostalgia is often something weaponized against people in an effort to gaslight them based on their opinion of something. It could be as harmless as saying they unironically enjoy Sonic Adventure 2, believing it to have a solid structure in terms of level design, theming, soundtrack, and even art style, sometimes even the characterization of Sonic and company. Before there were defense videos of Sonic Adventure 2 like there are now, the general consensus was more against SA2 for its multiple playstyles and glitches here and there, and anyone admitting to liking the game including its weaker playstyles was going to attract someone to try and use what I like to call the nostalgia goggles fallacy, a type of argument that shames someone's taste solely on the basis that they played it as a kid and therefore cannot have an opinion be taken seriously. Hello everyone, Alec Alger the Sidequestian gentleman here, and today I'm going to take a look at the Nostalgia Goggles fallacy. You see it used on the internet quite often, and here's why it's a failure of an argument to make, and an unjust accusation, for the most part. If there's one thing I despise about internet discussion is that some people simply want to state they like games without further elaboration, and expect it to be treated the same way as an opinion that has a lot more said to back it up. It doesn't really add much to the discussion of said game by simply stating you like it, and then when asked, sometimes they just resort to being defensive akin to, oh, it's just my opinion, god. Now, not everyone does this, but I've seen it happen a bit, like on Facebook fan pages. I mean, just stating your opinion doesn't add anything, it just shuts down the conversation before it even begins. But here's the thing that objectivists and subjectivists alike want to know. Why have you come up with said opinion? Do you like the level design? Do you think the level design could have been improved upon? Do you like the music soundtrack for its composition? Do you like the instrumentation? You know, those kind of nitty gritty details. Discussion of something from the past should ideally share something of substance. I mean, if it's just an anecdote about your childhood and how the game got you through some really hard times like a divorce, or maybe even an extended stay at a hospital, stating that you like said game is perfectly harmless in that case because we at least have something new added and something to think about. Something that only you experience with said game. No bold claims like, the haters are wrong, are mentioned in this case. It's just a simple anecdote about the game. Even if it isn't about the specific content in said game, there's nothing worth challenging in said anecdote. And if someone gets on your case solely for liking said game after that anecdote, despite not making a bold statement against the tractors, then yes, they come off as unnecessarily aggressive and that's just not cool. Because the thesis statement of that thread isn't about whether the game in question is good or bad. I've played some really flawed games that got me through some really rough patches in my life that I appreciate for being there, even if I don't really like them anymore. But what about the things we enjoyed as kids that we still enjoy to this day, if not more so than we did as kids? Sometimes even intelligent conversation regarding these things can still have the nostalgia goggles fallacy thrown at us just to try to invalidate us, even though it's a very futile effort because they don't really come up with counterexamples. 
The word nostalgia can be a bit too much of an umbrella term for what is just a fondness for the past or something from said past. It's the positive feelings associated with memories of said object, not necessarily the object itself in this day and age. Which looking at the definition from its most literal sense, it makes a whole you only like this game just because of nostalgia argument so devoid of thought is that it is just an assumption and only that. And you know what they say about assumptions. When you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. And here's how nostalgia works in the real world. Despite having nostalgic attachments to things from the past, it takes a lot more than nostalgia to make it hold up in any sense. The object in question has to be good or even better than we remember. Like the movie Finding Nemo, for example. I liked this movie as a kid because it was a fun adventure film about Marlin and Dory trying to find Marlin's lost son Nemo, who was captured by a diver and purchased by an Australian dentist for his niece. And they meet all sorts of crazy characters like you would expect in an adventure movie. And despite it being a film aimed for kids, watching it as an adult with adult experiences to relate to made me appreciate the finer details that went completely over my head as a kid. Like, I laughed my butt off when I realized that the sharks who abstained from eating fish were a parody of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when Dory accidentally starts bleeding, Bruce the shark smelled it and fell off the wagon, commencing a tense chase scene. As a kid, it was just build up to said chase scene. I like learning about the sharks and how they're trying to abstain from the fish for whatever reason. But as an adult, I finally understood the real world parallels to this meeting, and just seeing his fellow sharks hold him back while he was relapsing, it was mirroring the AA buddy system. My god, that's just brilliant. I mean, I always knew the Pixar writers were clever, but whenever I watch any of these movies with a few exceptions, I'm always finding something new that completely went over my head initially that I just appreciate more. And look at that, I just talked about a scene from a movie I saw as a kid, and upon rewatching it as an adult, with the adult knowledge I acquired in my lifetime, it just made me appreciate the scene more than I would have ever done as a kid. So, where are the nostalgia goggles? I have glasses on, but they're not rose-tinted. Don't believe me? Well, in this day and age, Finding Nemo holds up well from an adventure movie standpoint, and a lot of its writing has a universal timeless quality to it. What exactly has aged about this movie? I don't recall any pop songs or dance numbers that were only popular when this movie was released and nothing further than that. They did have a cover of Somewhere Beyond the Sea by Bobby Darin for the credits, but that song is also timeless and beloved by not just those who grew up in the 50s, but also much later than that. Plus, it relates to the movie. It takes place underwater, so what's more appropriate than Somewhere Beyond the Sea? And just because I like Finding Nemo doesn't mean I'm blind to where it occasionally falls short. I mean, given this was a computer animated movie in the early 2000s, the water effects aren't as advanced as its sequel Finding Dory, and that's a harmless statement. I still like how the movie looks from an artistic standpoint, especially from the use of lighting for scenes like the tragic intro scene. But when CG looks better all around in the later years, my nostalgia for the earlier movie's visuals isn't making me hesitate from calling Finding Dory a much better looking film from a technical point of view. If I liked Finding Nemo based only on nostalgia, theoretically I wouldn't hesitate to call the earlier film better looking just because I watched it as a kid. Now let's talk about a movie I loved so much as a kid that hasn't held up that much, to be honest. Like, I didn't always have great taste in movies, in fact, I tolerated a lot of stuff that I just cringe at in adulthood. So with that said, let's take a look at The Phantom Menace. Oh boy, it's no secret that I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and at one point I loved all the movies except for Attack of the Clones, which I hated even as a kid. But Star Wars The Phantom Menace, when I was a kid seeing it for the first time in 2003, I loved the CG, especially for the creature designs like for Sebulba and Watto. I loved the story as it showed what Anakin was like before the original trilogy. I loved the look of Naboo and even Tatooine. I loved the space battles and action scenes, especially the one of Above Naboo. I even love the characters like Qui-Gon Jinn, Darth Maul, and most of the Jedi. As for now, well, I think this movie is a bit overhated at times, but as a standalone movie, it's just an average sci-fi movie with some very uncanny valley CG aliens at the pod race. Looking at you, Sebulba. The dialogue is also really hokey, even more so than A New Hope. Are you an angel? What? An angel. 
I heard the deep space pilots talk about them. They're the most beautiful creatures in the universe. No, Anakin. Far from it. She's a politician. And really, the only character I still like is Qui-Gon Jinn. That's about it. He's the real protagonist of The Phantom Menace, as he's the one putting his life on the line in the interest of thwarting the invasion of Naboo. He even helped the slave boy gain his freedom to pursue a life with the Jedi Order, despite his attachment to his mother. And Jedi are forbidden from having attachments. That was pretty much an established rule even in the original trilogy. But everyone else in The Phantom Menace is so two-dimensional to the point they might as well call it Star Wars Episode 1, Qui-Gon and Company. Like, Obi-Wan's arc can be summed up as, I'm with him! And Darth Maul, despite having a really cool and menacing design, is really overhyped. Sure, he has a cool battle against Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan that's well choreographed, and I get he's supposed to be the Darth Vader of this film, but Darth Vader was better characterized, and hell, there's even a dialogue exchange between him and Obi-Wan hinting that this black-suited monstrosity betrayed Obi-Wan at some point. Darth Maul? Well, he's just doing his job, nothing personal, it's just business. But as a result, I don't really get invested in him. The Phantom Menace overall is an action-adventure sci-fi movie, no doubt. I love this so much as a kid, but now I don't hate it, but I don't love it either. It fails to have a compelling conflict for me. Hell, the guys who caused the invasion didn't even get killed in the end. They are just told they'll have to kiss their trade franchise goodbye, while we're left wondering what the future Emperor will be up to. So despite loving this movie so much as a kid, the nostalgia I did have for it cannot save it from what I see it as now. Back then, good action scenes with a booming music score playing was all that could satisfy me back then, but as an adult, I need more than pretty action scenes with good special effects to keep me invested. And I especially need more than one character to care about, especially if there's so much emphasis on the other characters that I don't care about as much. And I know I spent a lot of this video talking about movies, so let's talk about the nostalgia in video games, because video games were often the most popular hobby that kids had, you know? If you went over to a friend's house, you didn't just watch movies. I mean, occasionally you'd watch movies, but you'd most likely have a two-player game ready in the console. As a kid, I grew up with the Nintendo 64 console. I loved games like Star Fox 64, Star Wars Rogue Squadron, Donkey Kong 64, you pretty much get the gist. I have nostalgia for those games, but that doesn't mean the nostalgia keeps them as the once great experiences I had as a kid. I mean, Star Fox 64 is still the incredible experience that, while having some flaws, the great memories I had are sometimes even better with a more design-oriented mindset, such as the replayability of Star Fox 64. Some of the boss battles are great as well, and the R-Wing controls very smoothly in the on-rail sections. Just locking onto enemies and getting a higher score is still as gratifying as it was back then, and fighting the larger-than-life bosses are still great fun, and yeah, while levels like Aquas kinda suck due to being slower paced and having annoying enemies, levels like Sector X have an admirable two-route system with three ways to end the level depending on observation and performance. Not to mention the ruined space station and the slower, more mysterious sounding music makes it very unsettling, setting up the boss at the end of the stage quite well. It's still one of my favorite games, but to be honest, Star Fox 64 3D came out back when the 3DS launched and it makes one of my favorite games of all time even better. Like the levels look so much better with superior textures and better atmosphere that it's a bit hard to look at the original with its flat textures and washed out colors. Like look at Bull Station for example, it's darker, illuminated by the purple lasers, and it's even more atmospheric as a result. Look at Fashina, formerly Fortuna. You can now see Snowfall making it feel much colder than before, and Venom is even more hellish with its barren landscape. If I was wearing these so-called rose-tinted nostalgia goggles, wouldn't my taste more align with uglier looking textures that haven't aged the best from the Nintendo 64 era? And what about games like Donkey Kong 64? I mean, it's still a functional enough collectathon, but it's way too big and bloated for its own good, with a bare minimum golden banana count and other item count to finish the game still being too time consuming to be gratifying to me as a player, because on top of the mandatory 100 golden bananas, I still need to beat 4k rule arenas, have the rare Nintendo coins, 
which requires you to persevere in these older Nintendo and Rare Arcade style games. It's just way too much, which is a shame because I didn't mind having all these things to do as a kid, but now as an adult, it just feels like exhausting busy work at times, and it's no longer the once great game I used to love as a kid. Where are the nostalgia goggles? I want them! Like, wouldn't it be nice if we could just go back to when everything I played was awesome? But that's not how it works in the real world, because as you grow older, your interests change, your priorities change, you have different ideas because you were exposed to different ideas, more mature ideas than ever before. And that's why the nostalgia goggles fallacy doesn't really hold up that well, because it doesn't account for these types of changes that come from the exposure of the adulthood experience. Because at the end of the day, it takes a lot more than just fond memories of a certain time period to make these products still be as good as you remembered them to be. Don't get me wrong, some things hold up great upon a revisit, while others weren't really as good as we remembered. Probably aged about as well as a half-drunken Gatorade bottle from seven years ago that you just found under your bed being like, huh, I remember that. It's easy to look at the past when things you were into was state of the art, where nothing could ever get better from there. But then the future comes, and some games either abandon the better elements of past games or improve upon them. It depends on what the player prioritizes as a member of said product's fanbase, and saying someone still likes a product solely on just nostalgia and nothing more is ignoring the reality of subjectivity, the reality of what they feel when experiencing all the highs the game has to offer, as well as all the lows, like... And do you know what the worst crime of the nostalgia goggles fallacy is? It shuts down the conversation before it begins. No one walks away from that conversation enlightened afterwards. Just one smug jackass having some sense of self-importance, and a pissed off person unfortunate enough to give them the time of day. No one gains anything by dismissing their opinion without even knowing them as people, without knowing why they like said product. But one thing's for certain, they would most definitely have no reason to hear you out as you haven't given them a reason to believe the conversation would go anywhere worthwhile. So don't make a bad faith assumption like their opinion is based only on nostalgia and nothing else. It may not be conveyed the best, but that accusation is most likely not going to get anywhere. But there is the other side of the negativity spectrum, and that is the condescending gaming grandpa mindset. The kind of fallacies you would hear like, Kids these days, we're no good video game if it bit them in the rear end. You know, that kind of fallacy. Don't worry, it doesn't reflect older gamers because being a condescending gaming grandpa is a state of mind. It's all up in here. I know people younger than me who become condescending gaming grandpas, so please don't accuse me of being an ageist. I know people twice my age who have to deal with these people on a regular basis. So, until next time, thank you all so much for watching. I did not expect to make this video to be a two-parter, but for the sake of making a cyclical editorial, why not? I never did a two-parter before, well, with the exception of that season 5 finale, but that was more of a collection of mini editorials from questions I got from viewers, so this is the first two-parter that I've come up with a script that's actually in two parts, so until next time, thank you all so much for watching, and remember to stay awesome. Another crisis on another world. How predictable. Dr. Jim, Alec Elger requests warp entry into the laboratory. He's warping from Earth Base SQ-606, but appears to be of a different biological configuration, indicating he's one of the invalid side questions. Ah, uh, that's our side question, gentlemen. And from the looks of the bioscans, he was illegally sold a new body. Let him in. Affirmative, Doctor. Dr. Jim, you are the clone scientist, right? You have a lot of explaining to do. 
Let me guess, this has something to do with the renegade clones, Abel, and the shapeshifter, Psyquesticide, does it not? Wait, you knew about this the whole time? Well, I kind of would have to know. Not to mention they're pretty hard to miss given that they're all over the interdimensional news. Why do I have a feeling that that corrupt as hell leader and his Dr. Strangelove wannabe scientist has something to do with this? Wouldn't surprise me, personally. The head professor himself actually came here all by himself, off the record, purchasing several clones after Project Interloper was a bust. Let me guess. He's trying to fund his private little army out of his own pocket so the government he works for doesn't know about it. I sense a betrayal coming. What a twist. Oh, he definitely wants his own little private army to perform a coup d'etat. That I completely understand, given the state of the Psyquestian government and its overbearing nature. But for some reason, he paid me a very generous amount just to release the rejected clones into vital alternate Earths that have Psyquestian occupation. As to why, part of the stipulation of the payment was no questions asked, and I am not one to dishonor deals we make. Well, nothing like a little bit of anarchy to distract the interdimensional government. Well, that's not my problem. Back to my problem. What do I do about these f***ing clones? Well, your house should be secure from all future threats. Those globalized warp blockers that even the Psyquestian government doesn't know about aren't just there for show. But there is always a back door. So you're telling me they're going to continue being a problem even though I have all the necessary defenses up. Great! Looks like I'm gonna have to hunt them myself. Well that shouldn't be too hard to do. Check out the latest news.